Now, let's then move on to, on the agenda uh, to the presentation of the draft program of the Conference of Speakers of the EU Parliaments in Vienna on April the 9th, uh, the 8th and the 9th of this year. We have included two main topics on the draft agenda of the Conference of Speakers. The first session will be dedicated to the European Union and its neighbours. This agenda item will deal with external relations of the European Union and neighbouring countries. In that regard, many aspects can be addressed. Future cooperation, enlargement, security issues, migration, just to mention the most obvious ones. As the relations to countries of the, on the Western Balkans were, were among the priorities of the Austrian presidency, we will invite in agreement with the uh, Troika all EU candidate countries, Iceland, Norway and Switzerland, as well as Bosnia-Herzegovina and Kosovo to the meeting. In order to make the participation of Kosovo possible while complying with international regulations, all written documents will feature the term Kosovo with an asterisk and an explaining footnote the first time Kosovo is referred to. Flags will only be, be provided to EU members, table flags to EU members and candidates. At the COSAC meeting we had in Vienna during our presidency, this solution worked fine and we are confident that, that this is acceptable for all of you. We are aware that neighbourhood is not limited to the Western Balkans. Therefore, also the Eastern Partnership or cooperation with the Southern Partners of the Mediterranean may be included in the discussion. However, not least due to limitations of space and time, we cannot invite more countries to the conference. As to the keynotes, we have already approached Slovakia as the current chair of the Visegrad Group and France to deliver a keynote speech on this item. Let me thank um, Mr. Andrei Danko, Speaker of the National Council of the Slovak Republic, for his readiness to accept the invitation. Furthermore, we have received requests from the President of the Ital Italian Chamber of Deputies, Mr. Fico, and the President of the Hellenic Parliament, Mr. Wutzis, to intervene as keynote speakers in session one. The second agenda item will deal with the European Union ahead of the 2019 European elections, further development of cooperation between national parliaments and European institutions. 2019 will be a crucial year for the European Union. The Union will probably be reduced to 27 members and the European Parliament, also with fewer members, might face a different composition. Also, national parliaments play their role ahead of the European elections, and we ha have to find ways how to develop best our already close cooperation with European institutions. We have asked the President of the European Parliament, Germany, and the Netherlands to give speech keynote speeches. At this point, I can already confirm Mr. Wolfgang Schäuble, President of the German Bundestag, and we also thank him. As we have been informed that the President of the European Parliament will have to leave already on April the 8th, he will deliver his keynote at the opening session of the conference. Furthermore, we have received a request from the President of the French Senate to intervene as a keynote speaker in session two and uh, um, within the last few days also from the Italian Senate. After that, we will then debate and adopt the conclusions and the conference will end on Tuesday, the, uh, the 9th of April with a lunch. The evening dinner gala um, 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 on the evening of April 8th um, the venue has yet to be decided, but in any case, there will be uh, um, a gala dinner 
uh, uh, at the night of, of, of 8th of April. The invitation for the speakers' conference will be sent to you shortly, also containing the general information with organizational details. The hotel information has already been provided, as reservation deadlines for hotels in Vienna are usually tight. Therefore, we highly recommend to book rooms for your delegations as early as possible. If you are planning to arrive already the day prior to the meeting, let me draw your attention to the fact that the Vienna City Marathon will take place on Sunday, the 7th of April. And therefore, due to roadblocks in parts of the city, including the city center, we highly recommend to arrive in Vienna after 5 p.m. that day, in case you are not staying at the, at the Intercontinental Hotel. For all other hotels access, roadblocks will partially be lifted beginning at 2 p.m. until 5 p.m. There will be VIP transfer from and to Vienna Airport, as well as transfer from the Austrian border for those arriving by car. Delegations will be provided with one limousine for the speaker and one minibus for the accompanying delegation. For additional cars, you are kindly requested to get into touch with your embassy in Vienna. Then, for the, the two days of, of the conference, for transport to and from the hotels um, uh, and to, uh, uh, to the conference and to, uh, for the dinner venues, uh, buses will be provided. Finally, some words about our conference venue. As our speaker has already uh, told us, um, the, the conference will take at the Wiener Konzerthaus, situated in the city center, being the residence of the Vienna Symphony Orchestra and other music institutions. Those areas of the Wiener Konzerthaus, which, will, uh, which we will use for the conference, will be adapted accordingly. Speakers and presidents will be seated in one row in an oval configuration. Behind them will be two rows of tables and seats on each side. In addition, there will be more seats for the rest of delegates, so that uh, in, in, in short, uh, the whole of the conference will be able to be seated in one room. And to give you a short impression, let me now show you a short film uh, um, about the Wiener Konzerthaus, Konzerthaus fo followed by some photos of the different areas of the Konzerthaus used as our conference ven venue. Please. Haben Sie gewusst, wie viele verschiedene Räume es gibt im Wiener Konzerthaus? Das ist der berühmteste, der große Saal, 2000 Besucher, eine einzigartige Mischung aus Jugendstil und Historismus oder wie wir Architekten gerne sagen, Kraut und Rüben. Es gibt aber auch noch andere Räume. Im Konzerthaus gibt es noch zwei weitere historische Konzertsäle von 1913. Den Mozartsaal, der wegen seiner fantastischen Akustik von den international besten Musikern häufig für Tonaufnahmen verwendet wird und den Schubertsaal mit seiner wunderschönen Kassettendecke. Der Berio-Saal ist weniger historisch, er wurde erst 2000 aus seinem ehemaligen Stuhldepot geschaffen. Dafür ist er umso moderner, mit beweglichen Bühnenelementen und veränderbarer Akustik. Es waren aber erst vier Räume und insgesamt gibt es eben wieder Konzerthaus. Alle Konzertsäle sind an ein Tonstudio angebunden und an einen Regieraum und an einen ORF-Aufnahmeraum. Es gibt Künstlerzimmer, um sich für Auftritte vorzubereiten, Orchestergarderoben, Proberäume, ein Arztzimmer, Toiletten, Werkstätten, wo das Interieur gewartet wird, das Konzerthaus Archiv, Restaurants, Bars, Foyers, 15 Stiegen, 6 Lifte, 2 Lastenlifte. Und natürlich viele, viele Büros bis hin zum Intendantenzimmer. Insgesamt gibt es im Wiener Konzerthaus 640 Räume 
Aber wenn ich gewusst war, wenn ich das gewusst hätte, würde ich diesen Film nicht machen. Ha. Okay, so um, you might have got a very general impression on the multitude of, of functionalities of rooms in the concert house, and, and I would now just like to show you uh, a few photos of those rooms which will be used for our conference. The, the first one is the, it's the, the, uh, the, the meeting room for the, the Troika at the beginning, then the Great Hall, of course, um, uh, as the meeting room for the conference of the speakers. And uh, then the so-called Schubert Room, Schubert Hall, uh, where the lunch will be served. Yeah, that's the three, basically the three rooms which we, you will see uh, um, uh, during, during the conference. So, um, with, the, with this, I'm at the end of my presentation for the agenda and the program of the um, uh, uh, speakers' conference, and uh, I am now opening the debate, and the first uh, who has asked for the floor is uh, Klaas Martenson. Please. Thank you, Mr. Dossi. Dear colleagues, first of all, I would like to thank Mr. Dossi and his colleagues for arranging this conference, not the least yesterday evening's dinner, with its surprise that was highly appreciated, I can assure you. It is now over 10 years since the EU Speakers Conference in Lisbon agreed on the guidelines for interparliamentary cooperation in the EU. Since then, the Lisbon tre Treaty has entered into force and we have seen an extensive development of the EU interparliamentary cooperation based on the treaty. The EU Speakers Conference has established no less than three standing interparliamentary meetings in addition to COSAC, and there is a fourth to come, counting the interparliamentary meeting for the evaluation of Eurojust. There are also developments in the practices of the uh, European Parliament towards interparliamentary cooperation, most notably the yearly arrangement of the European Parliamentary Week. In my opinion, the main value of the EU IPC guidelines is to give a an comprehensive and accurate notion of the function and features of the EU interparliamentary cooperation. And frankly, this is not the case as, as it stands today. Therefore, I suggest that bringing the EU IPC guidelines up to date should be put on the agenda of the EU Speakers Conference. To be clear, bringing up to date does not mean to fundamentally revise. A mandate for bringing the guidelines up to date should be narrowly defined in an order not to provide an open space for discussions on how the EU interparliamentary cooperation should operate. Rather, the process should aim at ensuring that the guidelines correctly reflect the way of the EU interparliamentary cooperation uh, uh, do operate. A mandate ought to focus on new functions and meeting constellations, as well as a closer alignment to the treaty provisions on interparliamentary cooperation and, where relevant, the role of the national parliaments in the EU. A mandate could also provide limited space for revision, for instance concerning the outline and linguistics of the guidelines. I would also be in favour of including a paragraph on the benefit of using modern means of communication in the interparliamentary cooperation as a complement to physical meetings. Now, on the interparliamentary meeting for the evaluation of Eurojust, I suggest this issue should be put on the agenda of the EU Speakers' Conference as well. It might well be that the Eurojust regulation provides sufficient guidance in respect of the interparliamentary meeting on Eurojust, its format and frequency, that is to say, administrative uh, provisions, nothing else. It would uh, nevertheless be natural that the EU Speakers Conference puts down an agreement of all parliaments on the basics of this meeting as a matter of clarity so that it could be included in the EU IPC guidelines. 
To conclude, I suggest that the EU Speakers' Conference in Vienna establishes a working group mandate to put forward a proposal for updated guidelines for the interparliamentary cooperation and asks the succeeding presidency to prepare in a suitable manner a common understanding on the interparliamentary meeting for the evaluation of Eurojust when it comes to composition and frequency and matters like that so that the Speakers' Conference in Helsinki in 2020 will be able to reach conclu conclusions on these matters. Thank you, Mr. Dossi. Thank you. The next on the list is uh, Mrs. Maya Lena Pavola fr from Finland. Please. Thank you very much, uh, dear colleagues. Uh, first of all, I would also like to thank uh, our our host of this, uh, arranging this marvelous conference, conference and the marvelous evening yesterday in Palais Epstein. It was a good start for this conference. I would also like to thank um, class for raising this uh, topic. Uh, I agree with the uh, general idea Descriptive documents like the guidelines uh, should be up to date. On the other hand, we need to consider the, the effort uh, involved. Previous guidelines um, were long in the making, as there are sensitives uh, involved in several parliaments. It is important that we stick with the idea that the guidelines are descriptive and not normative. We should not open up any Pandora, Pandora's boxes such as the relative authority of, of the speakers versus other parliamentary bodies. Before the issue is put on the agenda of the speakers' conference, the Troika should formulate a narrow mandate for a working group and seek advance clearance. Uh, class has suggested some useful elements. I would seize on class's mention of modern means of communication. It would be good if we could reduce the number of poorly preparatory physical meetings. I would suggest that the working group studies this proposal as a separate issue. If there is broad support, take it into the guideline, guidelines. If not, deliver a separate report. If time allows, it would be good for the working group to give some thought to possible synergies in the secretariats of the, of the different parliamentary conferences. Could, for example, um, the Cossack secretariat in time become the nucleus of joint secretariats for other conferences. This is not yet a proposal, only a suggestion for a further study. As for the Eurojust issue, I would suggest uh, at first an exploratory approach. The presidency together with the Troika will need to decide whether there is sufficient um, agreement among the parliaments in order to make a descriptive mention in the guidelines. Thank you. Thanks a lot. Um, the, the, the next one is uh, Giovanni Rizzoni from Italy, please. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Secretary General. Again, uh, thank you very much for your warm hospitality. We enjoyed very much uh, the party yesterday evening. Uh, well, uh, I take uh, the floor only to support the idea of uh, having uh, more keynote speakers in the two sessions because I think that uh, this would enrich the debate of the speakers. Have, as uh, you have uh, mentioned, uh, for instance, uh, the topic uh, of the relationship uh, between the European uh, Union and its neighbors uh, has many aspects. So I think that uh, the present more presentations by more keynote speakers uh, would uh, improve the quality of the debate. Thank you very much. That is all. Thank you. Um, 
Um, next one, um, uh, Mrs. Agnieszka Kasmarska from, from Poland, please. Secretary General, dear colleagues, uh, Secretary General, um, all gathered in this room. Well, first of all, allow me to thank you for this very good organization of this meeting and the uh, great uh, atmosphere uh, during last night's dinner. We do not have any comments about the agenda uh, of the conference of the speakers. Uh, however, as regards session number two, which is entitled the European Union ahead of the 2019 European elections, I would like to propose uh, speaker of the Polish same, Marek Kochciński, as another uh, keynote speaker. Thank you very much. Thank you. And uh, the next one, um, Monsieur Jean-Louis Jurich Girard. Monsieur le Secretary General, cher collègue. Dear Secretary General, um, dear colleagues, I would like to add my words of thanks and uh, thank the European Parliament and uh, obviously. Um, you personally, Mr. Secretary General, for the excellent organization and uh, yesterday's reception. As regards the speakers' conference, uh, we do agree that the topics chosen are uh, very well chosen. Also, the um, neighborhood policy and as the Austrian presidency has shown this year's Romanian presidency is also rightly focusing on the Western Balkans and their integration into the European Union. The European neighborhood policy is also a sign of cooperation with the, the um, partners along the Mediterranean shores. The president of the French Senate, Mr. Larcher, has therefore announced uh, to present uh, the analysis of the French um, Senate. Uh, this is a topic which is very dear to his heart. And as regards the speaking time for this topic, uh, the French Senate president uh, would also like to speak on the second topic. This is a topic which is also very important to him, the relationship between Europe and its citizens, also with regard to these very important European uh, elections that we are um, facing in spring. Of, of the, the wishes to, to, to take the floor. Um, um, so, to sum it up, I would like to thank the um, Hellenic Parliament, the Itali Italian Chamber of Deputies, the Italian Senate, the French Senate, as well as the Polish Sejm uh, for their show of interest to take over a keynote sp speech. Um, um, basically, I would like to, to say uh, that we would very much like uh, to limit the, no the number of keynote speaks uh, with not more than four keynotes for um, every agenda item uh, in order to leave um, um, enough time for a discussion and then of course also uh, the last round for the, for the keynote speakers. Uh, so uh, we will consult all these wishes uh, within the Troika and uh, within the very near future we will come back to you uh, um, um, particularly to those of, uh, of you who have um, asked for the opportunity to have a keynote. And I'm very confident that we will uh, be able to uh, present a, a package that uh, should be acceptable uh, uh, um, on, on the basis of regional and, and, and political balance. Uh, but we will, we will come back to you on that. As to the Swedish proposal um, for um, updating the guidelines for interparliamentary cooperation, um, um, we have discussed this yesterday evening in, uh, in, in the Troika, um, and as uh, our Finnish colleague has already told us, we have the impression that the issues at hand are of a quite technical nature, so that we, in fact, would like to propose for the speakers' conference uh, to um, put up a mandate for a working group 
uh, but explicitly a technical mandate and would ask the upcoming Finnish presidency uh, to take care that uh, the working group um, um, keeps to be limited uh, to the technical mandate uh, which will be given uh, to it uh, um, at the, the speakers' conference. Um, as for the second um, um, uh, proposal by our Swedish colleague, uh, namely also to take care or, or to address the question of how to organize uh, parliamentary scrutiny uh, within the Eurojust uh, regulation. Um, we have the impression, uh, also having discussed that uh, in the Troika, that the questions to be addressed in this context are very limited because most of the frameworks uh, uh, for interparliamentary scrutiny uh, in, in Eurojust is already um, solved and addressed in the uh, Eurojust regulation itself. So, um, um, uh, with this respect, we would very much ask, uh, like to ask at the speakers' conference the um, Finnish um, um, presidency to elaborate on this question and, and to decide uh, uh, whether the um, Finnish presidency um, sees a need for establishing uh, um, a working group too, or rather after having uh, um, uh, looked at the problem, the Finnish presidency, presidency might come up with uh, its own proposal on, on, on how to uh, address these issues. Um, I think that um, addresses all the things um, 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 having, um, having said uh, during the last round, um, so that I am um, confident that that might, might, might solve um, all these issues. Are there any comments? as to my, my summing up. If not, thank you very much. And I would now, uh, dear colleagues, uh, like to invite um, uh, Mrs. Silvia Michalcea, the Secretary General of the Romanian Chamber of Deputies, and Mrs. Isabella Kencian, the Secretary General of the Romanian Senate, to give us an overview of the events under the parliamentary dimension of the Romanian presidency of the Council of the European Union. The floor is yours, please. Dear Secretary General Dossi, esteemed colleagues, ladies and gentlemen, as you already know, Romania took over uh, the beginning of the year, the presidency of the Council of the European Union. And um, this is a great opportunity for us to show our political will and administrative capacity in strengthening and supporting the consolidation of the European project. Um, while I will be reading my presentation, um, on the slides you will see the priorities of the Romanian presidency. And at the end of our presentations, a short movie will be played regarding our history and traditions. Now I would like to draw your attention to the working agenda of the Romanian Presidency, which will focus on four main pillars. Europe of convergence. This implies ensuring convergence and cohesion in order to achieve sustainable and equal development opportunities for all citizens and the member states through increasing competitiveness and reducing development gaps, promoting connectivity and digitalization, stimulating entrepreneurship and consolidating the European industrial policy. Maintaining a safer Europe. Romania aims at consolidating a safer Europe through increased cohesion among EU member states, states in dealing with the new security challenges that threaten the safety of the citizens and through supporting the cooperation initiatives in the field. Strengthening the EU global role. Romania will support further consolidation, consolidating the global role of the EU through promoting the enlargement poli policy, the European action in its neighborhood, further implementing the global strategy, ensuring the necessary resources for the EU and implementing the EU's global commitments. The Europe of shared values. 
the Romanian presidency aims at stimulating the solidarity and cohesion on the EU promoting policies on combating discrimination, ensuring equal chances and equal treatment between men and women, as well as through increasing the involvement of the citizens, in particular the youth, in the European debates. Our parliamentary priorities come to th strengthen those set at the executive's level and are aimed at meeting the needs and expectations of the European citizens. The program of the parliamentary dimension of the Romanian presidency of the European Council comprises seven interparliamentary conferences out of which five are traditional statutory conferences and two are thematic conferences. The Palace of Parliament will be the, the host, the headquarters uh, for our informal ministerial, meeting, ministerial meetings and four of our interparliamentary meetings, events, scheduled in the margins of the Romanian Presidency of the EU Council. Um, we counted and it's somewhere near over 160 meetings taking place in the Palace of Parliament. And this is a very great challenge for me and my colleague from, uh, from the Senate. When choosing the items on the agenda of our conferences, we aimed high. We intend to touch upon the most topical issues of the European Union and to deliver tangible results while at the same time remaining within the limits of the priorities set by, uh, by the four pillars and of the tradition of exercising a parliamentary dimension of the presidency of the EU Council. The Europe of Convergence pillar will be tackled by two of our interparliamentary meetings, respectively, uh, respectively the Interparliamentary Conference on Common Agricultural Policy and Cohesion Policy, uh, uh, taking place in March 19th to 20th, and the plenary meeting of COSAC, plenary from June 23rd, 25th. Maintaining a safe Europe pillar will be tackled at the meeting of the Joint Parliamentary Scrutiny Group on Europol from February 24th to 25th, and the Interparliamentary Conference on Common Foreign and Security Policy and the Common Security and Defense Policy. The discussion on strengthening the EU global role will be dealt with the occasion of the CFSP and CSDP, while the pillar represented by the Europe of shared values will be covered under different approaches during all of our meetings, including during conference on the future of Europe. As the Romanian parliament has a bicameral structure, the representatives of the Chamber of Deputies and the Senate, as I already told you, will work together for the success of these interparliamentary meetings. The calendar and all the relevant documents are already on the official side and also on the IPEX side. And speaking of IPEX, um, I must confess that um, I feel proud that an uh, old Romanian colleague from the Chamber of Deputies is uh, currently holding the position of IPEX information officer, and I would like to congratulate him on, on uh, his very well done job. Well done, Kalin. Dear colleagues, I strongly believe that, in, uh, that we will succeed in reaching such results and in pushing the European agenda forward. We will be happy to share our experience with the um, country member states of the TRIO presidency, Finland and Croatia. I take advantage of this opportunity to kindly thank our colleagues from Estonia, Bulgaria, and Austria for their um, support and openness, openness during Romania's preparations for all these um, events and stay available to continue all our dialogue. Last but not least, I will be happy to welcome you, all of you, in Bucharest uh, for this parliamentary meeting. And I would like to remind you that the first one starts, as I already told you, uh, 23rd to 25th of February, uh, the meeting on Europol. Thank you so much. Thank you all for your attention.
Dear colleagues, first of all, please allow me to congratulate Austria on the success of its presidency. Thank you for your invitation, and I, have to, uh, and I hope to have a fruitful discussion and exchange of views. During the first semester of 2019, the Romanian Parliament will perform certain functions and will coordinate the development of the parliamentary dimension. Through the topics proposed on the agenda of the meetings, the Romanian Parliament aims at tackling the most significant issues of the Union and to ensure that the results of the conferences will draw attention of all the actors involved in shaping the future of the European Union. The priorities of the parliamentary dimension of the Romanian Presidency at the EU Council come to strengthen those set at the level of the executive, which are closely linked to the current legislative agenda of the European Union and are aimed at meeting the needs and expectations of the European citizens. Allow me to present you the events held by the Senate of Romania. The first one was the meeting of COSEC chairpersons held uh, in January, the 20 uh, and 21st of January. It was the first event organized under the auspices of the parliamentary dimension of the Romanian presidency of the Council of the EU. The event was held in the plenary hall of the Romanian Senate. I have the pleasure to present you an album of significant photos from the Cossack reunion. The reunion brought uh, together more than 140 member states representatives as chairpersons of the European Affairs Committees of member states, those of EU admission candidates, as well as representatives from the European Parliament and the European Commission. The conference focused on two major subjects, priorities of the Romanian presidency of the Council of the EU and on the cohesion and on how to ensure convergence through the multiannual financial framework instruments. The conference also prepared the COSAC plenary meeting, which will be held in Bucharest on June, as uh, my colleague uh, from the Chamber of Deputies has already told you. The outcome of the conference was the wish to contribute in strengthening the European project by permanently applying the principles of cohesion, convergence, transparency, solidarity, equality, and equidistance in relation to all member states. The second event which will be held uh, in the Romanian Senate is the Interparliamentary Conference on Common Foreign and Security Policy and the Common Security and Defense Policy, which will be held on March 7, 8, in the Palace of Parliament, of course. The conference provides a, uh, provides a platform for exchanging information and good practices among member states' parliamentary committees, which work in the field of foreign, security, and defense policies, the European Parliament and the U European Commission. The main object objectives of this conference are to strengthen security, to preserve peace, to promote international cooperation, and to develop democracy. The number of participants for the member states is around 300. The second thematic reunion in the Conference of the Future of the European Union that will be held on the 1st and 2nd of April. The objectives are tailored on two main pillars. First, Europe of common values with an emphasis on combating uh, anti-Semitism, racism, intolerance, xenophobia, and fighting hate speech. The second, Eastern partnership with the aim, to the aim to deepen and strengthen relations among the European Union, its member states, and its six Eastern neighbors, Armenia, Azerbaijan, Belarus, Georgia, Moldavia, and Ukraine. The number of participants for the member states is around 250. Dear colleagues, we are looking forward to meeting you in Bucharest as our guests. And now, please uh, uh, enjoy the movie my colleague was telling you about, about uh, Romanians' uh, tra traditions and presentation. Thank you.
Ce este țara? Țara este un pământ, un loc pe care îl porți în suflet toată viața. Un destin cu care ai fost binecuvântat la naștere. Sara, ca și mama, sunt de genul feminin. De aceea le iubim pe amândouă din tot sufletul nostru. Am câteva minute să te învăț despre țara mea, casa mea, despre România mea. E locul unde m-am născut. Locul unde străbunii mei și-au dat viața pentru independența și libertatea noastră. Și după multe veacuri, acum 100 de ani, în anul 1918, ne-am făcut o casa noastră, România. Eram noi, românii, uniți pe harta unui continent măreț, Europa. La început păream singuri, noi și eroii noștri. Însă apoi, eroii mei au devenit și eroi tăi, eroi Europei. Unirea a fost sute de ani în inimile românilor, pentru că ne era dor de o țara noastră, mare și rotundă ca o pâine coaptă. Dor e un cuvânt pe care nu îl știi, pentru că el nu se traduce în nicio limbă. Dorul e doar al nostru, e mai mult decât iubire, mai mult decât dragoste. Îl învățăm literă cu literă, bătaie inimii după bătaia inimii, până la infinit. Și de asta ne-a fost atât de simplu să-l construim în formă de coloană. Și uite așa, brâncușa nostru, te-a învățat cum arată sărutul și zborul măiastrei. Cu tristanța ra, lumea cea cu susul jos a dadaismului a început să-ți placă și ai zâmbit. Iar cu Enescu te-am purtat drept în inima noastră. Nu știai prea multe despre noi, însă ai pornit în zbor alături de voia și coandă peste toată întinderea care ne cuprinde. Și totul român de-al nostru, Titulescu, a vegheat la pacea lumii din poziția sa de președinte a Ligii Națiunilor. Erau începuturile țării mele și ale unei Europe venită după marele război. Acum când încep să mă cunoști, nu e așa că vrei să afli mai multe despre noi? Mrs. Uh, Michalcha, Mrs. Kenchian, thank you very much for the overview of the events um, uh, coming up during your presidency and also uh, particularly for giving us um, a, a little glimpse of the beauty uh, of your country. Thank you very much. Let us now move to the next point on our agenda, and uh, I would like to invite the Secretary General of the European Parliament, uh, Klaus Welle, uh, to give a presentation on the European elections, which will take place from May 23rd to 26th. Klaus, the floor is yours, please. much for this opportunity to give you some basic information about the European elections. As you know, uh, these will be elections with 27 member states, not 28, and accordingly the, mum the number of members of the European Parliament will be reduced to 705 instead of 751, except if Britain decides to still be a member on the 1st of July which for the moment we don't know. In that case, we will elect 751 members, including members from Great Britain, which are, if they are still members, under the treaty obligation to elect members to the European Parliament. Politically, we are in a phase where after difficult years of financial crisis, now support for the European Union has been picking up again. Support for the euro is even close to record levels. And strangely enough, since the Brexit vote in the United Kingdom, popularity has increased even in member states where maybe before it wasn't always that easy. Politically, we will again have Spitzenkandidaten, lead candidates, 
You are aware this was tried for the first time in 2014. European political parties said that they want to create a direct linkage between the citizens, a parliamentary majority, and who is going to lead the European Executive, the European Commission. This, by the way, is not such a revolutionary idea because it's what all of you are practicing in your own countries. Citizens do not only vote for a parliament, they also would like to know who is then going to run the executive. And accordingly, the European political parties, this time for the first time, also the ECR, the European Conservatives and Reformists, have decided to put up lead candidates again. The experience last time was a bit mixed. Wherever lead candidates were invited, were taking a, an active role, were presented to television, we made the experience that participation in European elections went up. We know that in some countries, 12% of the voters said afterwards that they participated because they wanted to have a say in choosing who should be running the European Commission. In other countries where it was more difficult for them to, sometimes I would even like to say to enter, uh, we had only 1%. So to invite them, to give them a forum, to open up national television for those candidates is crucial if we want to have a good participation. The main responsibility for the European election campaign is of course for national and European political parties according to the constitutional systems and also European political parties are now very much strengthened. We had three revisions of the basic rules that are governing them and they also receive financing which now allows them to play a much more active role which is why we are also going to see a prolonged campaign from these European lead candidates. But also the European Parliament has a responsibility, especially when it comes to information. We've therefore taken a number of initiatives. One is, for example, we have been setting up a website which is called What Europe Does For Me. So this is in order to change the direction and the way we communicate. We are not speaking about legislation we've been passing, but we would like to reflect on what are the practical effects on citizens' lives. So if you consult this website, you will, for example, find for every small region in the European Union, which is altogether over a thousand different regional and local entities, a local balance sheet on one, si on one page, what has Europe done for me? So in terms of environment support, in terms of infrastructural investment, things that concern people's lives. And we also have about 400 sheets which explain in practical ways what are we doing for citizens. For example, if somebody is suffering from diabetes and we can prove that the European Union is doing something practically against it, people will be ready to listen. Many people love their dogs and cats. If we can prove that we are good for their dogs and cats, we are relevant for their life. And last not least, of course, football. You know? If we are good for football, if you can watch football abroad, at least in my case, that's making the European Union more relevant. So what I want to say is we need to communicate differently about Europe, not about European events not about European personalities, not about European legislation, but what is the practical impact, the practical progress, the practical advantage Europe is having. We are also offering an opportunity for citizens to engage directly. We have a possibility for citizens to register on a central website, which we call the ground game. We have right now 150,000 European citizens who've said they would like to be active. Of those, 15,000 are considered to be people who are convoking meetings, who will send out leaflets, who want to take a very active role, a kind of activist role. That's a game-changing moment because technology is now allowing 
that we can have a direct linkage to the citizens and that citizens can engage for the European Union because they've made the experience recently that membership can also get lost and be lost with all the practical examples and the freedom that this provides. There's also a citizens app which can be downloaded from Android or Apple stores where all the key information is available uh, at your fingertips. And we will also try to provide more information during the election evening. Uh, traditionally, we used to be extremely accurate with figures at 3.30 at night, which was the typical administrative approach, which in business terms would be called low risk, low return strategy. Uh, it provided low risk, but it also provided low return. Last time we were a bit more courageous by providing figures at 22.30. I can also say I was more courageous because my then president didn't like the figures I presented, but they were accurate. So why are we doing this? In order to have an understanding that we are not just having 27 national elections, which we are having as well, but we also have a European election which results in a European Parliament with European political group and European political parties taking a key role. So this time we will have partial results at least as the moment as they are available as of 1830 in order to provide also better information for the national debate so that when you come to the national election evening, you are not only having your national figures, but at least everything that's possible to know also from the European elections. Content-wise, I believe that this legislature has provided a shift, and this will have consequences for the election campaign. Traditionally, Europe has been very much about opportunity. And the internal market, of course, is the key instrument to provide opportunity. That's not an issue that has gone, because there are still many untapped opportunities. We believe that there is 2,000 billion euros untapped growth potential, especially if we were to develop a functioning digital single market, the single market, but also an energy union. And that's the biggest untapped growth potential that's available for Europe altogether. So it remains relevant. But when we look at where are the citizens' interests, we see clearly that they put issues like immigration, border control, security and defense, but also climate change and also unemployment top of their agenda. And the common headline of all of this is security. So the European Union cannot be limited to opportunity. It also has to find an answer to security concerns if we don't want a huge gap to develop between what we are doing in the European Union and where citizens' concerns are the most developed. And when you ask citizens where would they like to see more Europe, it's normally exactly in those areas like immigration control, border control, security and defense, climate change and also fighting unemployment. And the third issue that will be center is the question with a rising China, with Russia that has become more aggressive, but also with the United States that's at least currently with its president less reliable than it has been after 1945. How can we build a Europe that can still protect us under those different environments. All those issues will need to find an answer in 2019. It's not only that lead candidates and European political parties will present their programs, it's also that the European Council will pass a leader's agenda, as they've done in 2014, which is setting the stage for the next five years. And as we did 2014, I'm sure that also the European Parliament this time will not vote for a candidate for president of the European Commission without having sufficient assurance about what the content agenda is going to be. And this was last time the 10-point Juncker plan. 
So 2019 is also a watershed moment for how and where Europe is going to be over the next five to ten years. I think it's very important that we have this opportunity today, but also during the leaders' meeting in a few weeks, because Europe is not the European institutions. Europe is still 28 in the future 27 member states. It's the European level and the institutions. It's the national level. It's national parliaments who play an important role in that construction. It's the regions. It's the localities. It's the citizens. Either we are all of us the European Union or that project will not be able to survive. And therefore, I ask you for your support, also to create support and awareness for active participation in the European election. And I'm grateful that we take this as a common challenge. Thank you very much. Klaus, um, thank you very much for this most interesting uh, presentation and information. And um, I think I'm uh, speaking in the name of uh, all of us uh, in wishing you and your team uh, the strength, the safe hand, and of course also the good luck in the obviously turbulent times leading up to the European elections. All the best. Thank you.